Part 1 You will hear a man inquiring about swimming lessons. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good afternoon, Shepperton Baths. Hello. I was wondering if you have swimming lessons on weekdays at your facility? Yes, we do. For adults and children. Which would you like? Well, it's for me, actually. So, for adults? We have adult beginners courses on Monday and Wednesday evenings. You can choose which evening is more convenient. You have to book in advance, though, as each course goes for eight weeks of 75-minute lessons. The next course starts in March. Do I really have to wait that long? I'm afraid the January-February courses have already begun, and we don't allow beginners to join a course once they have already started. Oh dear, I made a New Year's resolution to learn to swim, and I'm feeling very motivated right now, but I'm not sure how I'll be feeling in two months' time. I want to strike while the iron is hot. I understand. Perhaps you could book one of our trainers for private lessons. Then you can have lessons whenever and as often as you like. What's the difference in price? Well, the adult beginner's course is a total of £120 for the course that needs to be paid in advance. Per hour, it works out to be £10 per hour. It's inexpensive because it's an initiative subsidised by the government, the same as children's swimming lessons. If you wanted to have private lessons with a swimming trainer, that would be at the personal trainer rate, which is £35 an hour. Wow. That's nearly four times as much. Yes, perhaps you should wait until March. It might be a bit warmer then too. What do you mean? Isn't the pool heated? Of course it is. It's kept at 28 degrees Celsius all year round. It's just when the weather is chilly, it might be less pleasant getting in and out of the water. Oh, I see what you mean. I still think I'd like to start as soon as I can, though. I'm not really free in the evenings anyway, so I'd probably have to take the private lessons route, whatever time of year I start. It's never easy for me to get away from work early, so I'd prefer to have lessons very early in the morning, before I go to work. The swimming pool opens at 5.30 in the morning, and I am able to book lessons for you from 6am. Would that be early enough? I suppose if I did an hour's lesson and then went straight to work from the pool, that would give me plenty of time to get to work by 8.30. I know there's a tube station near the swimming pool. Yes, there is. Robson Street tube station in only a three-minute walk away. If I drove to the pool in the morning, would I be able to leave my car there all day, catch the tube back to the pool from work in the evening and then drive home? Yes, we have free parking for swimmers. However, the car park closes at 10 p.m., so you would need to get the car out by then. I understand. I don't think that would be a problem. So let's book my first lesson then. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. What's your name? Martin Reynolds. That's R-E-Y-N-O-L-D-S. OK, Mr. Reynolds. What day would you like to have your lesson? 
I can't believe I'm actually doing this after all these years. Next Tuesday, if possible, at 6 a.m. Yes, that will be fine. Your trainer on Tuesday will be Tony Butler. You just need to ask for him at the office. Tony's one of our most experienced swimming coaches. Can you give me your email address so I can send you a confirmation? It's martin95 at mailbox.com. Thank you. Well, if that's all... What about payment? You can either pay online, you'll get a link with the confirmation, or you can pay at the office next Tuesday before or after the lesson. We accept cash and all cards. I'll pay with a credit card then. What else do I need to bring? You need to wear a swimming costume in the pool, of course, and flip-flops when you are walking around, and you will need a towel. Thank you very much for calling, and we look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. Thank you very much. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a woman talking about recording oral histories of elderly people. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Today we have Vanessa Ward with us in the studio who organises an oral history project for this local area. Welcome Vanessa, can you explain a bit more about what this project is? Yes, certainly. Our oral history project is an historical record directly spoken by elderly members of the community. We interview people about their lives and record their responses on video. This way we have a permanent record of the life stories of many local people. What we read in history books is often very broad and rarely touches on local experiences. This is a chance to find out what life was like in the early part of last century with first-hand accounts of those who actually experienced it. The interviews have all been catalogued and are available as either the full videos or as written transcripts on the website of the local library for anyone all over the world to watch or read. So far we have interviewed more than 50 people and what is particularly fascinating is how varied the experiences of all our interviewees have been. Sometimes it seems incredible that they were all alive in the same time period. Their lives have all been so different. Most of the people we have interviewed have been residents of nursing homes and retirement villages in the area. When we first asked them to participate, many of them were shy and hesitant. But as soon as the camera was turned on and a few questions asked, I was amazed to see how animated they became as they talked about their early lives. I think they even surprised themselves at how much they can remember. We have heard a lot about people's childhoods during the Depression and their wartime experiences at home and abroad. Many stories were tragic, and others light and humorous, but they all contained a sense of resilience and community interaction. We have uncovered stories from farmers and shopkeepers, soldiers and refugees, musicians and artists. We have had stories of world travel and other stories from people who have never left the area. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 
15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. One of the most popular videos is the interview we did with Macy Johnson, who had been a suburban housewife and mother of eight children, who revealed that in her youth she had been a dancer in a travelling troupe. She tells many funny stories and her memory is excellent, None of her living family had any idea that she had lived this life before she was married. It came out for the first time during the interview. Another interesting video is an interview with Dr. Miles Sharp, who was the local doctor in the area for more than 50 years, some of it in the period before the National Health Service started. It is most interesting to hear how people coped back in the days before free medicine. We are continuing to add to our catalogue of interviewees, so if any listeners have family members that are interested in talking to us, we would be more than happy to interview them. It has been quite easy to find people who are living in institutions for the elderly, but we are keen to talk to people who are still living in their homes. These people are more difficult to get in touch with, but we would love to have them represented in the library as well. The process takes less than a day. A team of three people, the interviewer and two camera operators can record an interview very quickly. We have a set list of questions which we send to the interviewee a few days before the recording, so they have some time to think back and uncover their early memories. We also do this to make sure the interviewee doesn't have to worry that any of the questions might be embarrassing or controversial. The interviewee can mark on the list any questions that they do not wish to be asked. Each video is about 15 minutes long and completely unedited, except to jump from one camera angle to another. No one has ever said they don't want to do the interview. It seems we all have a desire to be included and remembered as part of history. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You hear three students, Roslyn, James and Margie, telling their tutor about a music video they are making as a university project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Rosalind, James and Margie, how are you going with your project for making a three-minute music video? Have you chosen the music yet, Rosalind? Yes, Margie is in a band called The Breakdown. So we are using one of the songs written by the guitarist in the band. None of the band members were too keen on being in a video, but as Margie is the lead singer, our video can just feature her, and that should work fine, we think. How do you feel about that, Margie? Won't being cast in the video mean you do less work on it? 
I don't think so. I should be able to still be very involved, particularly helping James in the post-production process. What are your specific roles in the making of this video? James, you first. As there are only three of us, we all need to get involved in every part of the process. Margie has the most music experience, and especially as it is her brand's music we are dealing with, she is going to be controlling the whole vision of the project, how the images relate to the sound. Rosalyn is going to be in charge on the day of shooting, but we will both be handling the camera and lighting. I'll be managing the post-production, though I expect the others to be heavily involved as well. How far along on the project are you so far, Rosalyn? We are planning to shoot it next Tuesday, but we have pretty much completed post-production. The song itself was already recorded some time ago, so we haven't had any work to do there. Firstly, we got together to come up with ideas for the video. The music itself is a slow-tempo love song, so we decided the video should be a narrative rather than a series of special effects, which would be more suited to a fast-paced dance video. We thought the song had quite a country feel, and there is a lot of Celtic music elements, so we imagined it in a rural atmosphere. We thought it felt right to shoot it on an old farm in the fields. Then we decided that it might add interest if Margie was wearing historical costume. So we are setting the video at the beginning of the 20th century during the First World War. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. So, what is the story, if there is one, Margie? The woman is singing about her husband, who is away at the war. The song itself is about the fear of losing love, so it fits in quite well. To make it clearer, there'll be a letter from him and a photo of a man in an army uniform. Anyway, here is the storyboard that we have already done on this tablet here. As you can see, we have illustrated each shot we are going to do and marked how long it will be and at what point the cuts would come in. We have decided to use soft lighting and minimal camera work to convey stillness and wide landscape shots to show the woman's loneliness. These marks here show the camera placement. The storyboard is very well done. I can clearly see where you are going with this. Where are you shooting the film? My uncle has given us permission to film it on his farm. Margie, you certainly have been a useful resource, providing the music and the location. We are making the most of what we have. The weather forecast says skies will be clear in the early part of next week, so we have booked a camera, light reflectors and stands, and some props and a costume for Tuesday. We are also bringing a portable speaker to help me if we decide I need to lip-sync any part of the song. We hope to film all day from very early in the morning. The benefit of using my uncle's farm as the location is that it is nearby and we can return if necessary the next day. But that would only happen if there were problems with the weather. After that, we will go into post-production by taking everything we have filmed into the editing suite here in this building. We have booked a computer with film editing software, and we are going to work on this all together. At that stage, we'll put together all the scenes in the order of the storyboard and add in any overlays, screen graphics, or effects at that time. So, when will you be able to show me a finished product? Hopefully in about two weeks. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 4. Part 4. You will hear a part of a lecture about NASA's use of fungi in construction in space. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. Science fiction often imagines our future on Mars and other planets as run by machines, with metallic cities and flying cars rising above dunes of red sand. But the reality may be even stranger and greener. Instead of habitats made of metal and glass, NASA is exploring technologies that could grow structures out of fungi to become our future homes in the stars and perhaps lead to more sustainable ways of living on Earth as well. NASA is prototyping technologies that could grow habitats on the Moon, Mars and beyond out of life, specifically fungi. Ultimately, the project envisions a future where human explorers can bring a compact habitat built out of lightweight material with dormant fungi that will last on long journeys to places like Mars. Upon arrival, by unfolding that basic structure and simply adding water, the fungi will be able to grow around that framework into a fully functional human habitat, all while being safely contained within the habitat to avoid contaminating the Martian environment. This research is part of a field known as synthetic biology, the study of how we can use life itself as technology, in this case fungi. Fungus is a group of organisms that produces spores and eats up organic material, like the yeasts in bread or beer, the mushrooms in salad, the mold that may grow if you let that salad sit in the refrigerator for too long, or even the organisms that produce antibiotics like penicillin. But the part of a fungus you probably haven't seen is mycelia. These tiny threads build complex structures with extreme precision, networking out into larger structures like mushrooms. With the right conditions, they can be coaxed into making new structures, ranging from a material similar to leather to the building blocks for a Mars habitat. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 36 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 36 to 40. This architectural project can't be just designing a shell. It's designing a home. That home is more than a set of walls. It has its own ecosystem of sorts, with multiple kinds of organisms alongside the humans. It's designed to protect. Just like the astronauts, fungal mycelia is a life form that has to eat and breathe. That's where something called cyanobacteria comes in, a kind of bacterium that can use energy from the sun to convert water and carbon dioxide into oxygen and fungus food. These pieces come together in an elegant habitat concept with a three-layered dome. The outermost layer is made up of frozen water ice, perhaps tapped from the resources on the Moon or Mars. 
that water serves as a protection from radiation and trickles down to the second layer, the cyanobacteria. This layer can take that water and photosynthesize using the outside light that shines through the icy layer to produce oxygen for astronauts and food for the final layer of mycelia. The last layer of mycelia is what organically grows into a sturdy home, first activated to grow in a contained environment and then baked to kill the life forms, providing structural integrity and ensuring no life contaminates Mars and any microbial life that's already there. Even if some mycelia somehow escaped, they will be genetically altered to be incapable of surviving outside the habitat. But this is just the start. Mycelia could be used for water filtration and biomining systems that can extract minerals from wastewater. Another project active in the NASA labs, as well as bioluminescent lighting, humidity regulation, and even self-generating habitats capable of healing themselves. And with about 40% of carbon emissions on Earth coming from construction, there is an ever-increasing need for sustainable and affordable housing here as well. The harsh environments of the Moon and Mars will require new ways of living, growing homes instead of building them, mining minerals from sewage instead of rock, but by turning to the elegant systems of our own natural world, we can design solutions that are green and sustainable, whether on distant worlds or our own ever-changing Earth. Fungi could be what brings us boldly into the future. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.